thank a few of our recent guests. Let me take a minute and thank uh, Doris Day and Charlton Heston and Melina McCoury and James Mason and uh, some great people. We've got in my studio today a man who has written an incredible list of hit songs. He is a dynamo. He is versatile, and his name is Julie Stein and uh, Arthur Cantor and John Garaccio over there and Paul San want to listen to a little bit of Julie at the piano in a couple of minutes, but let me tell you that uh, when you hear this man's songs, you wonder what he didn't write. It's just uh, incredible. Mr. Stein is impossible, infuriating, inconsistent, irresponsible, illogical, exhilarating, exciting, irrepressible, irreplaceable, and never, ever boring. And this is more than a, a book about a songwriter. It's, uh, it's incredible. It's uh, novelized, it would seem to be, and it's, uh, it's great. And as I say, he has written everything. Opposite me is a great newspaper man. Paul Sand was the executive editor of the New York Post up until about uh, when, Paul? 77, early in 77, when the Australians arrived. And now I you're left. doing... You, you left it then? I left to write full time, yeah. I thought it was time. A newspaper sort of dies at midnight, but a book uh, lasts for a long time, right, Paul? I think uh, newsprint is very thin, yeah. I spent too much time with it. I want to talk at great length about the angry decade, the 1960s. It's a fabulous looking cover. You know, when I think of the 60s, Paul, I think of, uh, it's almost like uh, you got to separate the, the early 60s and the late 60s. It's almost like, like two decades within one decade. I just have that feeling sometimes. Uh, not entirely, but the blood began to flow in 63 and never stopped flowing after that. It started out as another decade. I want to talk about that era and about the heroes and the tragedies. Opposite Paul Sam is a theatrical producer who, very close friend of ours, he knows theater from A to Z and Z to A, and his name is Arthur Cantor, and uh, Arthur, when you walked in, you greeted Julie Stein today, right? Is it uh, old-time friendship there? Julie was one of my first bosses when I was a press agent. Right. Matter of fact, I was, uh, I was just remembering uh, a wonderful show that you did, Julie, and I, to this day, don't understand why it, it wasn't a long-running hit. That was that play in any language. You remember the play? Yes. With Uta Hagen. Trevor Belloyne wrote it. Well, I thought it was a marvelous play. My first memory of, I worked for of, it. of a Julie Stein play is, uh, is, Papa, won't you dance with me? You can tell why I don't sing. Well, he wrote that, but High this is the one he produced. Right, I know. He has many uh, incarnations, Mr. Stein. Does. Were you the press agent for High Button Shoes? No. no. You were a baby. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. I was reasonably mature at the time. Arthur Cantor is now the producer of On Golden Pond, and uh, I was uh, I sat alongside you on the opening night. Remember? That's right, yeah. And I loved it, and I, but it was so noisy I couldn't ask you, uh, how did you happen to get such a glamorous uh, partner as Greer Garson? It says Arthur Cantor and Greer Garson present. Well, she's an old friend, and she's interested in producing. This is the third Broadway production that Miss Garson's done. Would you do more with her? I, as long as she wants to produce, I'd be delighted to have, have my name linked with hers, with hers. Mr. Cantor will invite the whole world to see on Golden Pond. I just want to say that if that man, Tom uh, Aldrich, doesn't get nominated for the Tony Award, then uh, I agree with you. Then the Tony is a phony, <laughs> but I think I think he'll be nominated. <laughs> and I'm Francis, sure he'll be nominated. How do you I'm make sure a, she will be too, uh, Mr. Stern, Sternhagen? How do you make uh, Tom? How old is Tom Aldrich? Fifty-one. How do you make him look eighty? Well, I think he spends about 20 minutes and ages 30 years. He puts a little makeup on and and uh, and an attitude, and that does it. Isn't that, isn't that the most important attitude? I think a, an actor can become, if he's a good actor, he becomes that inside. No matter if, if he wore the makeup, as you say, and he wasn't inside as great an actor, he would probably never could be so convincing at age 80. It happens from inside of him. You know. You know, there's a very touching vignette in the playbill, the first time I've ever seen one in the On Golden Pond program, in the biography of this actor, Tom Aldridge. At the very end of the biography, there's a sentence that says, Mr. Aldridge wishes to dedicate his performance to the memory of his father, Joe Aldridge. And when I asked him about that, he said, well, I'm very consciously imitating my dad. Yeah. His father died at the age of 83, wow. and Tom is living, reliving a lot of his father's 
man who wasn't too nice. Was he too, his father? No, his father was just a human being. You know, it just occurred to me, Paul, that <laughs> producers, producers don't need makeup. The producers age overnight. They get older overnight mm -hmm. just from worrying. Actors, actors need the makeup to look older, but the not producers. Time's produ review age is the producer. You're not kidding. Arthur, your show is a hit, but if a show is not a hit, if a show is a failure, does the producer ever feel that he's a failure too? As if he's failed if the show fails. Well, if he doesn't feel it that way, the people who put money in with him make him feel that way very quickly. <laughs> Great answer. Yeah. We're getting ready now for a little bit of Julie Stein. Everybody wants to, but I want to tell you that this, first of all, Arthur Cantor will talk about uh, on Golden Pond at the Apollo. This is a sense that, what, what excited you, what, what fascinated you, Paul, about the 1960s at the beginning? Well, at the beginning, uh, it was Camelot, and we were going to have nothing but a most marvelous decade. We were just going to dance in the streets for 10 years. We had a beautiful president in the White House and a, a more beautiful woman, and we were all 19 years old. Camelot, that whole mystic thing. Uh, well, it didn't last 100 days or 1,000 days, and turned to bloodshed uh, with uh, John Kennedy's assassination, and the blood never stopped flowing right through that decade into the 70s. Paul, the kids, were, State. the kids were in the minority because the big baby boom of World War II had just about uh, uh, culminated there. So, you know, it may have been a minority, but it was a very vocal minority that was tearing up the campuses while the blacks were burning down the ghetto. They made the noise. And the mass murderers were coming out of the woodwork uh, all over the country. It's a dreadful time. There's no time like it in the entire history of the country except the Civil War period and Reconstruction. I think you and I did some shows at that time, didn't we? We certainly did. Yeah. Well, you have to go back that far to find a decade like this. I don't think we could possibly have another one. I don't think we can shed that much blood. Any recollection, Arthur Cantor, of the 1960s and what... Uh... Well, oddly enough, uh, as Paul was talking, I remembered... I went to college with the late President Kennedy. He was a classmate of mine. I know. And uh, he invited me and my wife to the White House in 62 for the Nobel Prize dinner, which was an amazing dinner. And it was an evening I remember... Uh, very vividly, I'll never forget, because it really was Camelot. I remember that we were all, you, you know, you go. Uh, we went into the White House and we had a, this uh, cocktail reception, and then suddenly, the president and this gorgeous wife swept in to the room, and they played "Hail to the Chief," and it was right out of uh, an MGM musical. It was just yes, a, it a was. beautiful time. It was. Speaking of. John F. Kennedy, uh, president, late president, uh, I had a uh, lighter encounter with late president. It was, uh, I had a show at the, uh, this is an excerpt from my book. I shouldn't quote it, but I will anyhow. Uh, <coughs> I had a show at, on Broadway at the time called Do Re Mi, and it had a, the number one song in America called Make Someone Happy in it, and I, was home one night getting dressed to go out to another theater, not my theater at all, and a call came from an airplane call. I'd never gotten a plane from a call from an airplane. It had to be, was, I thought someone was kidding. And it was Pierre Salinger. Was that the press? Yes, Salinger. Yes, Pierre Salinger. Says, this is Salinger. You know, like Rachmaninoff. This is Salinger. Uh, I'm flying over uh, with the uh, president and he'd like to see your show tonight because Make Someone Happy is his favorite song. He, two tickets on there, he'd, he'd like to sit, uh, make it C-101 and 102, or 103, whatever, together. Huh. He even gave me the location, so I said, gee, they'll be there. He says, well, be, be sure because the security men have the doors open. They'll be there at 6 o'clock. I call up David Merrick, who's producer. He said, gee, Julie, the whole theater is sold out tonight. It's a Jewish benefit. There isn't a theater. Even your, you know your house tickets. You don't have house seats for tonight. I said, well, it's a president of the United States, and you bet a security man are going to be there. And I, my loud, raucous Julie Stein voice, I said, you better have. I was threatening him. He says, don't threaten me. Call Schlissel, who's his general manager. <laughs> I called Jack Schlissel, and Jack Schlissel says, seat for seat, Jewish benefit. 
It's the best something temple from Newark, and they've got the whole house. But if you call a Mrs. Goldstein, I said, I don't know Mrs. Goldstein. Well, I, he said, well, then be in the lobby. Maybe Mrs. Goldstein will give you her two tickets, because she's got C-101 and 102. I arrived at the theater at 6.30, waiting for Mrs. Goldstein, who wasn't going to arrive until about 8. As I stood in the lobby there, lo and behold, security men were filing all over the place. I'm, I'm going to be a bum with the President of the United States for the first time in my life. He asked me to do something, and I can't deliver. And Mrs. Goldstein arrived at the theater at a quarter of eight with a row of orchids like Sophie Tucker used to walk in, from, from her shoulder down to the floor with, in wedgies with a gray mink coat. I said, Mrs. Goldstein, the President of the United States is coming tonight. I haven't got his ticket. He'd like to sit in your seats. She says, if the President of the United States wants my tickets, let him ask me. <laughs> so I ran out to the sidewalk as the president came in, and I said, I told him the story quickly. <coughs> and he walked up to the lady. He said, thank you very much for letting me have your tickets. And he gave me went down. As he left, Mrs. Goldstein fainted that away. Never saw the whole show. <laughs> she said, Yichalish in Yiddish. It means I'm fainting, and that was it. That's, That's my encounter with Kennedy. Great story. I want to bring in John Garecchio. He wants to listen to a little bit of Julie Stein. I'm chatting here. I just want to say that that man is unbelievable. When you hear a few of those songs, Paul, you're going to, you're going to uh, want to do a, a sequel, a follow-up to the first book. It's published by Random House, and it's called Julie. I just had a thought, though, that the, uh, the 70s are very... Uh, What's the word now? Uh, apathetic compared to... you got to tell me later how, a little bit now on how, how the activism of the 60s gave birth to such an apathetic decade known as the 70s. I wouldn't call it entirely apathetic. Well, compared. I, th I think some things have Pathetic happened. Pathetic is a better word, yeah. Pathetic. Uh, huh? like, like Watergate. Right. Uh, and a few other things, but nothing to compare with what happened in the 60s. We don't have the blood running in the streets now. We don't have the campuses tearing apart. We don't have demonstrations all over the place. Uh, but the word is not apathetic. Uh, I think Arthur had it when he said pathetic. That's much closer to it. It's pathetic in every way. Sometimes, uh, Arthur, what's... Uh, uh, the activism becomes, after a while, kind of unrealistic or un not idealistic, and the moods and the goals fall apart. And I, I think when kids get older, they get maybe more practical, more... Yeah, but that's the story of all uh, revolutions. I mean, they, you know, they, uh, I remember the, the reading about the French Revolution and that marvelous book about the French Revolution by Carlyle, and those particular sequences repeat themselves all during history and during all revolutions. But Nothing when, the, when the activists later on get cynical, they're so, they're so opposite from the way they were. I'd rather they would almost have stayed the way they were. Well, some of the activists of the 60s, you know, are, are just, uh, not just the activists, but hippies, the right. flower children. Uh, some of them are now very comfortably settled down in Swimming the suburbs they and own. Wall Street <laughs> or in Beverly Hills. Uh, they've got the good seats in the theater. They had their thing, and they grew up. Uh, they they got to where they eventually were meant to go once they got it off. Uh, so that uh, to that degree, uh, a this generation, uh, the '60s, has disappeared into the fabric of our current society, and uh, you can't identify them walking down the street. You can't look at somebody and say, "Hey, that guy was a hippie in the '60s." Because now he's got a, he dresses like Julie Stein. He's got a three-button suit on mm. and, Good suit. you know, fancy stuff. There's a lot of uh, excitement generating here because Julie Stein is about to give us a medley, follow a medley. This man's medley goes for 19 weeks. But these words then on with what I think has to be a show of shows. Stay with us. Do not leave. Garacio is uh, here alongside Arthur Cantor and uh, Paul San, and John wants to watch the Julie Stein uh, 
entertainment, but John first has a big introduction and a big announcement about an anniversary, and that's part of our function here. We let the people know about celebrations. The show is... Is Family Business, and next week we're celebrating our first anniversary at the Astor Place Theater. Are you the leading man? No, I'm not. One of, I like right. to think. <laughs> There's an old friend of mine, Harold Gary, in that That's play. That's right. We share a dressing room. Yeah. He's great. He, was the, he is the brother of a man named Sid Gary who died, but Sid Gary was on this program with Bing Crosby. Oh, they were on separately. Back. Remember that? Way back. Way yeah. back. And, and, yeah. uh, and they were partners. It was, it was Sid Gary and Bing Crosby, and they did double talk in vaudeville together. That's right. With Willie Howard, wasn't it? Probably. Probably. Yeah. yeah, Harold has great stories. I was on a show the other night. Somebody asked me, uh, are the actors better today or 50 years ago? I didn't know what to say. Well, how, how would you answer that question? Well, I know Harold thinks that they were better then, but he also thinks the baseball players were better then, too. So we <laughs> always disagree about that. Yeah, what do you think? The ball had a different weight. Uh -huh. Well, I think the actors of 50 years ago are much older today. They, they overacted. <laughs> they were, they were, they, they, they were, they over emoted then. Today, of course, is naturalism and realism. Who, who knows what's better? I don't know. I don't know which, which style was better. What's, uh, well, the whole business of the good old days yeah. and of, uh, in any one period, anybody being better than what we are now is to me totally ridiculous. We are who what knows? the hell we are at the time that we are living in the place that we are living in right. the atmosphere we're living in this notion that 50 years ago everybody was better everything was different i don't remember it that way nostalgia ain't what it used to be right <laughs> i don't think that everybody's better i i believe what paul just said part of it is right i think that there are people certain people it's the one of a kind that are better than anybody today, and there are people today who are better than anything in the past. I would say that Irving Berlin is better than anyone today. I say he's one of a kind. He's unique. He set the pattern. He made songwriters important by showing them the way how to write the popular song with much more liter much more literate than than they used to. Julie, uh, he watches, Irving Berlin watches this show every single night. He's well, watching I don't know you. whether he's watching. He's, he's watching. He's and watching. The, other, the other point is, uh, Al Jolson is one of a kind. And however, today there are great songwriters, uh, leaving Richard Rogers and Cole Porter, because they're of yesterday too. But there's fellas like Paul McCartney and Paul Simon and Billy Joe, they are better than a lot of the fellows who were coming up at that time, too. And they are of today. Uh, 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 I love that the point is one must not be bitter about today and the future and say it was better. Point is to go along with it and like what you like today. We had terrible songs years ago, like Mersey Dotes and some awful songs. Uh, it was the, the little fishy songs, and it was the crazy songs too. But today, some of it is that terrible, and some of it is terribly good too. Uh, I'd like to have the piano for a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody's ready now. We'll be talking I, about the before, books and about the shows, but in the spotlight, this man's medley could go for nine weeks, but as long as he wants, maybe eight or nine minutes, a few of the songs written by the one and the only Julie Stein, who has written his incredible book with Theodore Taylor, and it's called Julie, the story of composer Julie Stein, a great man who has written I'm unbelievable gonna, songs. I'm going to play one song rather than medley, because I think it's kind of fitting. It was a motivation for me ever allowing a biography to be done of me by the late Bennett Cerf, and that is because I like people, and the kick I get out of being a songwriter is that no matter where I am, some lady will walk up and say, I got married by that song. My daughter got married by that song. My grandchild was born on that day, and I got married. So I've covered a year. I'm 73. I started to write in 1929. So it's been a whole thing, you know, age and has nothing to do with it. I just go along with the times and change as the times change, yet still being myself. And because I love people as you do, Joey, or else you wouldn't be in this business. I know you love people. You can't wait to meet somebody new every day. And so I shall play a song that I wrote called People from Funny Girl.
tiny, tiny favor, because I got maybe 1,400. We're going to talk about the book, and I want you to meet your friends over there, but I got maybe 1,400 titles in my mind of songs. Right. Of your you tell me what, let, let me just pull out a few of my favorite Julie right. Stein songs, the ones I love. Right. It's magic. snow. about diamonds are a girl's best friend. It's incredible. This list nice. goes on. And no, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll play a few now. I'm going to go watch. All right. Well, this is a little parody written to a, the original lyric was by Sammy Kahn, but uh, when you read my book, you'll find out uh, once upon a time I gamble a lot of my money away. But anyhow, <clears throat> I laugh at that, and I sing this song. I only know what I know. The passing years will show. No, that isn't I. That's the original lyric. The little thing is, uh, uh, I only know what I know. I always bet, win, place, and show. It's kept me young. And feeling fine So time after time I tell myself that I'm So lucky So lucky So lucky that I'm Julie Stein We are just getting warmed up. I'll be right back with Julie and Paul and Arthur and John, and we're giving you today a show of shows, the best. I would love to do a word for America's number one honeymoon and vacation resort, Mount Airy Lodge in Mount Pocono, Pennsylvania, all year round, 52 weeks a year, the best, best food, best activities, Indoor, outdoor, you name it, they've got it. And I promise you, my friends, it is the number one fantasy vacation land in all of the world. Make a reservation. Business is booming at Mount Airy Lodge. show for you. I'm chatting here with John Garasio of uh, what theater now, Family? Family Business at the Astor Place. That's a fabulous comedy. I'm that's not like a father and son clothing store family business. Right? No, no, toy business, toy actually, business. yeah. I'm chatting here with Arthur Cantor, the producer of many, many shows, including On Golden Pond, which we'll get back to. Paul Sand, author of The Angry Decade, the 60s. And we're also involved with Julie, the story of composer Julie Stein, written by Theodore Taylor. And... Uh, are you happy with the book, Julie? I'm very happy with it because it's honest. It's, uh, it was devastating at first. You see, my, I had to sign a piece of paper with Mr. Taylor, who was chosen by Bennett Serp, that I would have no, you, you, you understand, a lot of it is all spoken to me. And then he interviewed people that were important in my life, you know, uh, uh, all the way from Sinatra, Streisand, uh, everybody uh, that, known as Stephen Sondheim, anybody who'd been associated with Julie, him. I want to give it to my panel, but I want to ask you, you just mentioned Sinatra, of course, it was everybody's favorite. When you were writing his uh, movies like Anchors Away, was he as full of fire and as assertive 
and confident then as now, or can that only come from living and no, from the years? No, always day one, from day one, and even when he was with yeah. the Dorsey band. Even then? Even then. <laughs> he, he must have learned a lot about him, Dorsey. Uh, in fact, he phrased Frank's big influence on Frank's phrasing was Dorsey. You know, Dorsey used to play eight measures of music without taking a breath on a trombone. You know, he, he had a long breath. And Sinatra sings, will sing, Sinatra will sing a whole passage, eight measures without taking a breath. Good wind. You know why? why? Not, to, not for the vocal phrase. See, Fra Sinatra doesn't phrase the music. He phrases the words. When you sit and listen to Sinatra sing, he tells you the story. He makes the lyrics where the, if the lyric is great, you are overwhelmed. And a lot of singers phrase the music, which is a terrible thing. They mm. fl uh, a lot of singers sing, and you don't understand the song. Because Streisand they, has a talent too. They lose the rhymes, you know, yeah. and they, especially to Ira Gershwin's lyrics. They they uh, yeah. they, they overphrase where the rhyme. Uh, Julie, the when rhyme. when you write a song, are you thinking how it'll sound when it's sung? Are you visualizing how it'll be sung by Perry Como or, or Frank? Well, there's Sinatra? no there's no set way. When no. I write a song, I don't know who's going to sing it. So, yeah. o uh, only in one case do I did I know two cases. Right. Th no three. One was writing for Sinatra. You have to first write a good song. Time after time. Well, uh, many. Uh, many. I right. wrote a batch. I had right. my whole Sinatra. I must have written 30, 40 songs for right. Sinatra. And that's including the ones he turned down. <laughs> uh, that's another story. <laughs> uh, but uh, for Ethel Merman, you know, Ethel Merman, when she did Gypsy, she had come off a show that was very, very bad for her, and everybody was saying around the street, well, she's had it, you know, what the hell, it's over, you know, it failed. What was the show? Uh, you know, the one that Doobie and Carr wrote. Oh, yes. And they said, oh, well, you know, oh. how much can we t take? And then Ethel, I, all my life I wanted to write for Ethel Merman. You see, before I wrote songs, I was a vocal coach. I was handled by a guy by the name of Lou Irwin, who handled Ethel Merman. I gotta tell you who he coached. You're gonna love this, John. He coached Alice Faye and Shirley Temple. Huh. That's the man who taught them. Okay. Uh, so, in writing for Ethel Merman, I wanted to put everything I knew that suited, that would be fantastically musically, but that Ethel Merman, they would say, She's the greatest. Now, we had a great story, and Arthur Lawrence wrote a brilliant book, and Stephen Sondheim wrote a brilliant set of lyrics. But if Stephen Sondheim writes to the song, to the tune. He doesn't write the music and say, set that to music, he, to set these lyrics to music. He writes, you play him the tune. That inspires him to write his lyrics. And I wrote the score for Ethel. What do you do when you're tired? You know, Arthur, you were a good friend of Billy Rose. And he was a great, for some reason, he was a fan of mine. He used to always send for me, and I'd go on top of the Ziegfeld Theater, and he'd play me all the songs. He wrote Barney Google and More Than You Know. And he told me when he was tired, he would doodle. And he said when he would doodle, sometimes he would just write a song by doodling. When you say he wrote, uh, I never have, to, I never leave a lyric writer out. Right. You know, you left the important part of uh, the song. You said uh, More Than You Know. Right. Uh, a little fellow by the name of Vincent Newman. Right, right. Who was... Uh, Vincent Newmans was a songwriter, a, a composer's composer. The man wrote about 100 songs in his entire lifetime, of which 70 are standards. Yes. It's an unbelievable thing. Vincent Newmans had a style. He, he wrote on a in sequence of three notes, like time on your hands, da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. He would take three notes and develop a song out of it. Most fellows have to go all over the keyboard to write songs. He wrote in three notes. Let's go down the line. I want to, we're sitting here with Julie. Let's start with John, then Arthur, then Paul. What do you want to say uh, to the master? What do you want to ask or say? Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Stein if he enjoys it when, for instance, a jazz group will take one of your songs and turn it around and, and do it in a totally new way. Maybe not it with the feeling that you originally had in mind when you wrote the song. Great I question. Love it. You do? love it. Oh, uh -huh. I love it. Uh, Oscar Peterson on the Grammy Award won the uh, best jazz album for this year, and uh, in it is uh, Just In Time, which he played on the Grammy Award. He played Just In Time for eight and a half minutes. Every chorus was different. Uh, you, the only way you knew it was Just In Time if you sang the song to yourself. Uh -huh. All the rest was a variation. Or if you wrote but it. But it's wonderful. Or if you wrote it. But it's, it's <laughs> wonderful. I love improvisation for music. 
I think that's how you get longevity. Mr. Every era comes along and does it their own way. Mr. Cantor. Well, no, I'm curious to know what is, uh, what's the top song, Julie? What's the most played song you've ever written? In terms of records, sheet music, all in all. Well, it Revenue, looked, I suppose. What no, song it, made it, you the most dough? It looks dough? like everything's coming up roses is going to be the biggest as far as really? performance. See, we, see, sheet music is a gone thing, practically, you know, of the songs. So records for the contemporary music, the new the kids, you know, Billy Joe records, they sell two, three million records. That's another avenue. But, and they sell it and it's over, right? One year, boom, next year, may, three years, he may not have a record, but it's over. Uh, people in the theater write for their performances in ASCAP. And that's how I know. The longevity of everything's coming up, Rose, of course, things like Just in Time and, and uh, Three Coins in the Fountain, and, just, and uh, parties over and those things get played. But it looks like people and everything's coming up roses are probably the two biggest copyrights I have as far as performances are concerned. How about Let Me Entertain You? Well, it gets played, but I'm talking about powerhouse kind of material. Don't Rain on My Parade is a perennial, I think, Julie. Yeah, but they're, they're not... Not like that. It's not like that. Did you write songs when you were a kid for Gene Autry? When I first started, right. I started at Republic Studios, where uh, if uh, Roy Rogers or Gene Autry were riding down the street eating watermelon, he had to write a song called I Like Watermelon. <laughs> and uh, if the sun was shining, he wrote The Sun is Shining. If he was fixing his shoe, you wrote My Shoes Fixed. That's why they, you wrote songs Are there Republic. any standards of yours from that era? I have a standard from a Republic uh, picture. Called? They called, uh, seems to me I heard that song, it seemed. Oh, so that's a standard that right. song. Yeah. What yeah. was that in? That was in a picture called, I don't know, Poor Little Rhode Island or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Sand, what do you feel about Mr. Stein? Uh, Joe, you can call me Paul. Paul. Uh, I'd like to know whether you could name your, let's say, three personal favorite songs. I have more than three of yours that I like. Can you name three that uh, you'd like to be remembered for? Well, I'd like to be remembered for the entire score of Gypsy, which I think has become a legendary thing. You have no thing. problem about that. No, and I like to be remembered. No, my answer is going to be kind of different kind of an answer. And I like to be remembered for the score of Bells Are Ringing because for that I met the most wonderful, talented lady in my oh, lifetime, yes. Judy Holliday, oh, yes. and to have written for her was something very special, and I'd like to be remembered for the entire score of Funny Girl because it gave me a chance to write for what I call the greatest singer, lady singer of my time. And I used to play piano. I played for all of them, including Fanny Bryce, including, I, I know all, of, all the singers. The past. And the other thing is, I'd like to be for remembered for every song that I ever wrote for Frank Sinatra, who was the greatest male singer I ever wrote for, and because he is, without a doubt, he phrases my music better than anybody ever did. And he says the words, and he's just something very special. Let me show the one The rest special, I don't care about. The rest you don't care. Let me show one picture of the Funny Girl uh, recording session. Here we see Sidney Chaplin, Barbara Streisand, and Julie Stein listening to the playback of the uh, records. That must have been an eventful day. And here we see Julie Stein getting married in 1963. That was after uh, Al Capone conducted your orchestra once. No, Al Capone goes way back in way my back. Chicago days, right. very, very early. <laughs> that's, uh, that's when I was playing band. Nin that's 1929, 27. 27. Uh, the, the, I'll tell you what it was, a week, uh, the Dempsey Tunney fight. Uh, I got a call in Chicago, to, and, and uh, the fellow says, Mr. Brown wants to see you. And uh, I said, uh, Mr. Brown, they said, well, just go, my trombone player. Uh, was of the same ethnic group, and he said, you better go down and see Mr. Capone, uh, Mr. Brown. Huh. And I went to the Metropole Hotel where I walked through a row of guard of 10 men on each side. I was frisked, and I walked into a room, and there sat Mr. Brown. Well, I didn't have to tell me Mr. Brown was, it was Al Capone. And he said, you know, I hear good things about you, Stein. He said, I want you to get a band together with me, for me, and play the whole week before the Dempsey-Tunney fight, which is, I forget what date it was, 
and you, the band will play every night. I'll have a different show. The Duncan Sisters, I want Harry Richmond one night. I want every known star at the time. And then the opening night of this event, I'm going to conduct Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> I wouldn't laugh. You laughed. I wouldn't laugh. I looked at the he man. Said I said, he was. Yes. He says, I want to conduct Rhapsody in Blue. You were doing with a machine says, gun or a baton? No, no, no. What a machine <laughs> No, I said, listen, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, do you know it? He says, well, I know it. It starts with a clarinet. I said, yes, you know it. He says, I look and I look at you. He said, you like Gershwin, don't you? I said, sure. Who, who wouldn't love Gershwin? Of course I do. Opening night. Like anybody you like. Opening <laughs> night. Oh, he said, my guests, my guests are very select. And that evening, there were 40 federal judges. 40 governors, about 60 mayors, or about 500 guests You're assembled. Uh, Sen sta that. United States senators, House of Representatives, congressmen, all over the place. They're all Mr. Brown. And I looked at it and I said, oh my, that night, and he conducted Rhapsody in Blue. They gave him a standing ovation. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. And I, uh, now, then I didn't care, but now I look back and said, what a power that man must have been having all these yeah, people. He conducted something better in a garage on North Clark Street <laughs> two years later. Yeah, two blocks later, away from my house. I want to do a big wrap-up with, with On Golden Pond, with Family Business, with The Angry Decade, but I've always wanted to ask Julie Stein, because he's got to be uh, my favorite, have your best love songs, and he's a romantic man, have your best love songs been written, let's say, when you were falling in love, or let's say going through the agony of falling out of love, or maybe in a non-emotional, just a, like a detached state of mind. No, I'll tell you when my best love songs were written, when I needed money. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you something about Inspired, you see. Love songs. I don't believe, see I'm a professional, right. as all these gentlemen are, professionals. Right. We don't, they're not inspired, we perspire, and you know, I write to, so sure, I, it's not that crass, but I know what I have to do, as any professional does, and I sit down and do it to the best of my ability. I don't have to be inspired by silvery waters or walk with a girl or anything, because that is only detracting. You do need a piano. I, I don't write at a piano. Oh. I, I don't write the piano. I flatter my ego by going to a piano after written it. I write, it, I write at a desk because uh, uh, I have found, having had my own band and coaching people and arranging, all, I know that all these people, for the most part, who sit at a piano and work it out are flattered by their harmonic, the, the, the beautiful harmonic inventions they can make, and the melody loses. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> so when I sit there and write it, uh, I'll tell you when I get inspired, when a song is finished, to make it better. Julie, but there must have been some time in your life when, when, when everything went blank, when, when there was no inspiration, you just couldn't find the idea for a song. Maybe once when... It's a terrible moment when that arrives. But if you work, and you work, and you work at it, and uh, I think the... I think the uh, responsibility to whatever you're doing at that time takes over, and. It, you deliver in some way. I think that's the only way. That's the definition of a professional. Yeah, well, I, I just... You I have to you, go up to the you, plate. You have to, you, ha you have to go up to the plate and... And uh, Arthur knows very well, Arthur was, before becoming one of the best producers around in the theater, he was one of the best press agents. Arthur, have you done a musical yet? No, you know, I've never done a musical. He's no never music. asked me, even. <laughs> you got to ask him to do it. I was going to do a thing of Arthur's. <laughs> Arthur produced one of the great plays, my favorite play of all time. You asked me to play. It was a thing called The Tenth Man. Ah, oh, fabulous. Yes, that Paddy Chayefsky wrote. And I started working with Paddy Chayefsky on it. I've got 100 pages of score that I've got to do as an opera. Paddy wanted to do it in an opera. And one day I'm going to get around to it. I'll tell you what stopped me, Arthur, was the, uh, all the pictures, uh, the Divic things that came along, The Exorcist, a few things. I thought, let them get forget it a couple of years because it would be suicide to try to do it. It's funny because The Exorcist is basically the Tenth Man all over again. Yeah, but it doesn't have the wonderful humor of Tenth Man was so
affectionate and lovely. It was. It was, yes. it was just, it was like being in a clinic in The Exorcist. Let me know? ask John Garazio where you uh, learned your craft, as they say, served your apprenticeship, you know? I was at uh, Brooklyn College for a while in Boston University and then came down and worked at the Roundabout Theater. I always see that phrase in the Sunday Times, regional theater. Uh, years ago they would say little theater. Now they, right. what, what is regional theater? Uh, Almost every major city uh, in, in the country has a theater uh, that, that produces plays on a regular schedule. They often cast out of New York City, and they do largely classical plays and then occasionally a new script, and, and the quality of the work is often quite, quite good. I have another definition for regional theater. Yeah. It's a theater where actors and creators get paid less. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on this show, everybody gets paid with the nice conversation. These words, then we're going to do the big wrap-up. Incidentally, if you want to read about uh, the 60s, as seen through the eyes of Paul Sand. This is the book, Julie. This is... Uh, well, I, I glanced through it. It's sensational. It's an incredible book. What a, what a research job, Paul. I'm so uh, oh, proud. I of trade your books. I paid some slaves. It's a fabulous. And yeah, on Golden them. Pond... You've you got to tell us in a minute about the, the refurbishing of that Apollo Theater. That's a bit of Americana for Julie. Following these words, stay with us. We're just not getting warmed up, just getting ready to warm down. But stay with us. Huh. Cool.